Hello and welcome to this online presentation in which we will discuss cohort studies and how cohort studies are used um, in answering questions around harm. So here we have again the evidence pyramid in which we have the randomized control trial up the top um, followed by the cohort study. So unlike the randomized control trial, the cohort study can only account for three of the four biases, that is performance, attrition and detection bias. Um, selection bias um, is fairly difficult to account for in a cohort study um, as the patients are often exposed or uh, not exposed to a particular um, intervention or exposure. Um, so there's no randomization uh, process per se. So cohort studies, unlike uh, randomized controlled trials, are uh, observational studies. That is, that they allow nature to take its course. Um, Control studies do have a control um, or a comparison group um, uh, associated with them um, and it basically follows um, uh, the follow-up of people with a common characteristic. So in a cohort study, uh, the incidence of a particular outcome um, is compared between those that have been exposed um, and those that have not been exposed to a particular risk factor during the study time. So much like a randomized controlled trial, um, it provides a very good evidence of cause and effect relationship between exposure and outcome. So in terms of a cohort study, participants are selected on the basis of their exposure. So have they been exposed or not exposed to a particular risk factor? Um, and then they are followed up forward in time, i.e. prospectively, to uh, identify whether or not they have a particular outcome of interest. So in this slide we'll just outline uh, the cohort study. Um, so traditionally speaking, cohort studies um, are prospective in their direction of inquiry. Uh, similarly, we uh, have a population from which that population we identify a particular sample, uh, again according to our inclusion exclusion criteria. Based on that sample, we can identify those patients, those, those patients that are exposed um, or those patients that are not exposed i.e. our controls or comparisons to a particular risk factor um, and then we can follow them up um, uh, forward in time to identify the presence or absence of a particular outcome. So the example that we use um, is to answer this question of how safe are ACE inhibitors in pregnant women. So ACE inhibitors um, obviously used for uh, hypertension. Um, they're contraindicated um, in, uh, during the, the second and third trimesters. Uh, but this question is asking, well, what about the first trimester? When quite commonly, a, a lot of women uh, may not know for the first four to six weeks that they may uh, uh, be pregnant. So this is a, a study done uh, in 2006, which was a cohort study uh, to uh, assess major congen congenital malformations after first, semester, first trimester exposure to ACE inhibitors. Uh, direction of inquiry was prospective. Um, our sample being pregnant um, women in their first trimester um, and, and the study investigators were able to identify those patients exposed to the risk factor, that, that is those patients taking um, the, the ACE inhibitor during their first trimester and were able to uh, compare them to um, a group of women uh, within the same uh, sample um, who were not taking um, antihypertensive medication during that trimester. The follow-up, um, obviously um, post-birth, post um, the investigators were able to identify that the risk of a uh, major congenital malformation uh, increased by 170% in women um, who were uh, taking that ACE inhibitor during that period. So in terms of the actual cohort, um, in the previous slide our cohort was, uh, or were women, um, uh, in their first trimester of pregnancy. So the cohort firstly needs to be accessible um, and they need to be outcome free prior to exposure. That is, they, they obviously haven't had the outcome as yet. Um, within that sample, we need to obviously identify those um, who have uh, who've potentially had the exposure um, and those um, who have not had uh, the exposure. The follow-up of a cohort um, 
really varies depending on, on study to study. So it will vary in terms of the, the outcomes of the study, um, uh, sorry, the objectives of the study, um, but also the outcomes being assessed. So the obvious implication is the longer the follow-up uh, period, the more prone uh, a cohort study um, as well as a, a randomised control trial is um, for, the pen for the potential of um, dropouts or, or withdrawals or attrition bias. Cohort studies have several advantages, uh, the first being that they can identify the natural history of a disorder. Um, so they can identify that because we've both got our exposed and our uh, not exposed groups. So we can identify the natural history uh, according to those two uh, groups. Um, it can also identify what we call a temporal uh, sequence between cause and effect. Um, or, or cause an outcome. So we can identify um, the, the, the time period between um, uh, exposure um, and, and the first onset of the uh, outcome. Um, as mentioned, um, they're, they're very rigorous epidemiological designs, um, so, so their only um, bias that they can't control for is selection bias, um, and they're also very good for rare exposure and com Limitations. As mentioned, selection bias um, can play a, 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 a factor. Um, cohort studies are not very well designed in terms of um, studying rare diseases um, because we rely on um, such great numbers uh, to compare between exposure and um, uh, non-exposure to risk factors. So if the disease is rare, uh, the potential to identify those exposed um, becomes difficult. Uh, loss to follow-up, uh, again, if, if we're looking at a study such as, let's say, the, the Framingham study, which has been uh, conducted for, for over 40 years, um, the, the loss to follow-up um, will um, increase significantly over um, the, the duration of time. Um, and finally, cohort studies can be consuming, uh, time-consuming. So quite often cohort studies um, uh, may, may, may be long in duration. So associated with that is... Um, uh, costs associated with outcome assessment and, and follow-up of patients as well. So we mentioned that the majority of cohort studies are prospective in their nature, but we can also have what we call retrospective uh, cohort studies. That is, participants are identified on the basis of um, previously um, recorded exposure to a particular risk factor. So in this example, we, we may be doing a, um, a cohort study where here we are at you know, 2013 and we've identified our sample and those that have been exposed to a risk factor and those not. But we also uh, can incorporate a retrospective um, component. So we identify patients um, uh, previous to 2013 who we can then follow up forward in time as well as our prospective patients. So hence um, uh, that being our retrospective uh, component of our cohort study. Um, another way to look at it is, um, uh, let's say we're, we're looking at um, the, the rate of pregnancy loss after mid-trimester -tri amniocentesis. So here we have um, a, a time period of um, 12 to 13 months. Um, and let's assume um, in this example we're beginning our trial or our cohort study in the month of April. So if we were to do that, um, we would be doing a, a simple um, prospective cohort study. So uh, we would have patients um, who would be exposed to the potential risk factor, that is um, the amniocentesis, and those that are uh, not exposed or in our comparison group. Now, the retrospective aspect may be that um, we have patients that were um, uh, part, part of a, a particular hospital cohort or whatnot, um, that, we're, that we can refer to um, that were recruited in, let's say, January. So we can go through uh, medical records and identify patients in January who were uh, exposed to amniocentesis or not exposed to amniocentesis. Likewise, we could go back and identify patients who went through the um, uh, study centre in, in February and were exposed or not exposed and likewise identify patients in March who are exposed or not exposed. So once again, this is sort of the, the retrospective aspect uh, uh, of a study. Um, so if we're merely looking at this 
um, aspect of the cohort study. It would be a, a retrospective pro, uh, a cohort study. And then, once again, we would follow them up um, prospectively um, in terms of... Cohort studies are very, very useful. Um, and uh, this is an example of um, such a case where um, we're, we're looking at the um, MMR controversy, um, where a, uh, a particular study was published uh, in The Lancet, um, so probably one of the most exclusive and highly prestigious uh, journals um, in all of medicine. Uh, which uh, looked at um, a case series of, of patients of, uh, of uh, 12 children um, and, and uh, hypothesised that there was a link between uh, them um, having the MMR vaccine and increased risk of autism. And so, um, as you can imagine, this was um, highly controversial uh, during its time. The study results were refuted by this large cohort study. So in this case, um, it was a retrospective cohort study uh, done in Denmark um, with children um, uh, re recruited from uh, 1991 to 1998. So one of the, the good things about the Scandinavian countries is um, they have a lot of databases in which um, uh, participants or, or consumers or patients are uh, registered so um, so they can commonly uh, perform these retrospective um, analyses and identify um, people who have or have not been uh, exposed to a particular risk factor and then follow them up um, forward in time. A particular um, study was able to refute the um, earlier claims in the Lancet um, and if we look at just um, um, this particular example here um, in terms of autistic disorders, um, this large uh, retrospective study actually identified that MMR vaccine um, was associated with a an eight percent reduction um, in the risk of um, autistic disorder, um, and a further seventeen percent reduction in any of the um, other autistic spectrum disorders. So, quite strong evidence to refute the um, earlier claim from the Lancet study. Finally, this uh, slide just um, hopefully summarises the, the strengths and the weaknesses of cohort studies. So in terms of investigating rare diseases, um, it's, it's a, a weakness, but cohort studies are useful and um, uh, do have strengths in investigating um, rare causes, um, identifying um, or testing multiple effects of, of causes, um, identifying the um, the temporal relationship between cause and effect and also um, uh, directly measuring the incidence of a particular um, disease.